Hi everyone, welcome to Astronomy 236. We are now in week three and we're finally starting to get into astronomy topics. So today we'll be talking about measuring astronomical distances. So if you look up at the night sky, you'll see the stars. And in some cases you can even see stars making patterns. But most of the time, these patterns are an illusion. This is an image of the Orion constellation. It's a pretty famous constellation that you can see in the Northern Hemisphere. And I've connected together some of the lines for these stars to kind of give you an idea. This is supposed to be a human. So do these stars actually seem to be similar in where they are on the sky? Are they actually similar in where they are in real life? And the answer is no. These stars are not at all close together. So here is what the Orion constellation looks like if you were to come and look at it from the side, if you were to look at it from a rotated point of view. So on Earth, we see, as in the bottom left corner here, all of these stars projected onto the sky, looking like they may be close together. But actually, the distances these stars are quite different. Some of the stars are nearby and within a couple hundred light years. Some of them are thousands of light years away. So when you look at things in the sky, one of the biggest challenges that astronomers have is trying to figure out how far away these things are. Because without that knowledge, you really don't know what you're looking at. You don't know how far away it is, you don't know how bright it is, and you don't know if things are related or not. Humans are pretty good at telling how far things are when we look at them in our everyday lives. And the way we do this is by taking advantage of the fact that we have two eyes. And if you look at an object in front of you, the eyes, when your eyes try to focus on it, they will have to look at slightly different angles if it's nearby. So if I put my finger up in front of my face here and I focus on it, my eyes will be angled towards each other and you'll see this convergence, this, uh, my two eyes pointing towards a point that's very close by so they are angled together. If I instead look off in the distance and I see something, then my eyes are gonna have views that are more parallel. And our brains can interpret this as a distance. It tells us how far away these objects are. We also can use clues such as the size of the object to give us a little bit of an idea. So intuitively, our brain realizes that maybe this tree on the left here is closer to us than these other two because it's physically larger. And if they're all about the same size, the larger one is probably the closer by one. But these, uh, these tricks that we use for everyday life don't really work when it comes to astronomy. Here's an image from the Digital Sky Survey, the Digitized Sky Survey, which is a full set of images from the entire sky. And what I'm showing here is kind of a field of stars with this weird fuzzy thing, which we'll get into later this week. So, we can't look at these stars with our eye and see the depth of them. They're just too far away. There's no way we could possibly tell the difference between a star at 400 light years and a star at 1,000 light years based on the angle between those two objects that our eyes make when we focus on them. The other thing is that we can't necessarily assume that bigger objects are closer by. Is this fuzzy spiral closer to us than these little tiny stars? I don't know. We'll discuss this later on in one of the next lectures this week. So our normal tools for understanding distances that humans use are really not very useful in astron astronomical context. So how do we get around this? Yeah, so is this star closer to us than this large object, or is it larger because it's close by and we can see more detail? We can't tell from this image alone. So how do we get around this? How do we measure astronomical distances? And the basic idea is that we have to start small. So the first step is to measure distances within our own solar system. One of the ways that we do this now, and the most precise way, is we shoot laser, or we shoot radar beams at these uh, other planets and the other objects in our solar system. So imagine you have a radio dish and you send out a radar pulse. That radar will travel through space at the speed of light it will bounce off the planet and it will return at the speed of light. We can measure how long it takes for the light to travel this distance and how long it takes for it to return to us. If we calculate the distance, then it, it, it ends up being the speed of light times the time it took to return divided by two because there's both a trip towards the planet and back from the planet. 
So this is a really, really good way to measure very precisely the distances of objects in our solar system. Before we had radar technology, we could do it in other ways. In particular, a historically very useful way was by measuring the transit of Venus. So when we look at the sun from Earth, occasionally, once or twice every century, you will see another planet like Venus uh, travel in front of the sun and block part of its light and cast its shadow on us. And we see that as a dark spot moving across the sun. And by very precisely timing how long it takes to do that and observing it from different parts of the Earth, we can convert that into a measurement of the size of our solar system and essentially the distance from us to Venus to the sun. So this is how this was done before we had radar technology. So once we have a distance in our solar system, we can start using some of the tricks that our brain uses to measure distances, but in an astronomical context. So we can in fact use this idea of depth perception to measure the distances to astronomical objects. But instead of only looking at the difference in angle when we look from one part, one of our eyes to the other part of our eye, we can use the entire solar system. So imagine that you observe a bunch of stars at one time of the year, perhaps in March. And then six months later, the Earth has orbited around the sun and has come to the other side. So in September, we observe those same stars again. If the stars are nearby, we should see this effect where we should see that our, the, the line that we have to make to observe the star, the angle that the star makes with respect to our telescopes is a little bit different. And we can see that as a change in where it appears compared to the background stars, stars that are very far away, so far away that we wouldn't necessarily see them move. So if we had a close object, we would see some sort of convergence. And if we have a distant object, we would basically see no convergence. The lines that we point towards this object would be parallel. They would be basically the same direction, no matter what season. So to visualize how this works, you can do an experiment with your hands. So imagine you hold up a finger and you focus your eyes on it. What you'll see is that the background uh, goes a little bit fuzzy. Now, focus on this finger that you're holding up and close one eye and see where this finger lays on the background. Now, open that eye and close the other one. What you'll see is that your finger appears to have moved with respect to the background. This is exactly what we're doing when we try to measure this for astronomical objects. And this is called parallax. So what happens is as you orbit the Earth and you take images of the star, if it's nearby, you should see it moving with respect to background objects. We have recently launched a new telescope that's main purpose is to measure these parallaxes. This is the Gaia mission. It was a spacecraft launched by the European Space Agency. And Gaia's job is to basically measure the distance to billions of stars in our nearby solar neighborhood. This is a revolution in astronomy. We now have distances to many, many stars that we never could before. And it, we get some really beautiful maps of our neighborhood based on this. So this is a map based on Gaia data. You can see the star in the center, the bright star in the center is our sun. And now we accelerate away from it through this simulated 3D model of our galaxy based on the positions and distances that Gaia has determined. And you can kind of see us moving through and you can see little structures there. These may be clusters. Uh, it's really an amazing data set and we've learned a lot about our neighborhood from it. But Gaia and parallaxes can only take us so far. What if we want to measure distances to objects that are even further away than we can use parallax, where no matter what time of year we observe, they're just so far away from us that our observations look like they're moving in exactly the same direction. There's no change with respect to the background. In these cases, we have to use other methods to do this. So one of the most uh, successful methods is the idea of a standard candle. So this is a bit of a strange name, but I'll explain what it means. So imagine that you have a candle and you see that candle burning at nighttime. If you take a, 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 a camera and you take an image of that candle and you measure how much light you're getting from that camera, you can count up all of the uh, photo electrons that your camera let off when it was uh, exposing, when it took that image and count up just how bright this candle is. You can then use that 
to estimate how far away a very similar candle is. So if I take this close-up image of the candle and I measure its brightness, if I take that same candle and I put it further away, it should be much fainter. We should be getting less light from that candle because it's further away and therefore appears more dim to us. And if we bring this candle back and we put it at a medium distance, it should be brighter than it was further away, but not nearly as bright as it was when we first inspected it very close up. So this is exactly the kind of thing that we like to do in astronomy. And in particular, one of the very important standard candles, these objects which we know how to measure their brightness in an absolute way, we know exactly how bright they are absolutely because we've taken measurements of a set of them which we've controlled, are variable stars. So I'm showing here an image of a galaxy. And it's an image that's been taken several times over the course of a night or two. And what you'll see is that some of the stars in this galaxy remain relatively constant, but others seem to blink on and off. And they seem to change in brightness and they seem to change in color as well. What is happening here? It turns out that some stars don't necessarily have a constant brightness. They change in brightness over time. Some of the most famous stars like this are called Cepheid variables. So this graph here is showing the light that I might measure at a telescope of a Cepheid variable star if I took measurements over and over and over. And in each measurement, I counted up just how much light we were getting from that star. So on the y-axis, I'm showing the light you would measure at the telescope. And on the x-axis, I'm showing the time. So over time, what you can see is that the star brightly, uh, rapid, rapidly brightens up to a peak and then it slowly decays before it starts rising again. And it repeats this pattern every period of time, in this case, 5.4 days. The fundamental breakthrough that allowed us to use these Cepheid variable stars as standard candles and to use them to measure distances was uh, identified by Henrietta Leavitt, who was an astronomer at Harvard in the early 20th century. What she did was she was the first to notice that the period, the time it takes between two consecutive peaks of the brightness of the star or two consecutive troughs is related to how bright that star is overall. So if you take the average of those brightness measurements over the entire time, the longer the period, the longer it takes for it to rise and fall in brightness, the more bright it is overall, the more bright it is on average. When you plot all of these data, and you measure the average overall brightness of these stars on the y-axis, and you compare it to the period, how long it takes between two consecutive brightenings on the x-axis, you get this tight relationship where short period variables are relatively faint and long period variables are relatively bright. So when you have something like this, you can then use those measurements to figure out just how bright that variable star is. And you can use that to figure out how far away it is by seeing how bright it appears in your telescope and comparing that to how bright you know it to be. You can then use that to figure out how far away it must be in order to appear that faint. So Cepheid variable stars are some of the most important objects in the sky for doing this, but they have their limits as well. In particular, they're not all that bright. So we can only see them out to certain distances. What about even greater distances? Well, in those cases, we can use a different type of standard candle. In particular, a really important one that's been uh, used in the last couple of decades is called a supernova. It's an explosion of a dying star. And we'll learn more about this later on in the class when we learn about how stars go through their life cycles. What's special about supernova, and in particular, one particular class of supernova called a type 1a supernova, is that they all have just about the same brightness. So they can be used as standard candles, but they're much, much brighter than Cepheid variable stars. So you can use these to probe distances very far away, almost out to, um, you know, to times early on in the universe. So the way all of this comes together is almost like a ladder. Every rung of this ladder depends on the previous rung. When we make measurements in our solar system, we measure just how far the Earth is from the other planets and how far it is from the sun. 
that measurement is crucial for us when we use the Earth's orbit to figure out how much stars appear to be moving with respect to background objects. Because you have to know just how far the Earth has moved back and forth in order to convert that to a measurement of just how far the star has moved when, uh, or how far away the star is based on its apparent motion compared to background sources. We can use parallaxes to measure the distances to Cepheid variable stars. And that lets us measure exactly how bright Cepheid variable stars are and, and calibrate our relationships and figure out just how bright they are as a function of their, or, uh, of their pulsation period. Once we've calibrated Cepheids and we know how bright they are, we can look for Cepheids in unknown regions and use those to figure out how far away those regions are. And when we see Cepheids that happen to be in the same regions as supernova, we can base our calibrations for supernova, our measurements for how bright the supernova are off of the Cepheids. So every rung depends on the previous rungs and it's turtles all the way down. We use these measurements in our solar system and we can extend them based on this distance ladder all the way out almost to the edges of the universe.